like calculator in for the primary objective. Yeah. If you just fail one of my asserts, yeah. uh, it doesn't give you credit for the primary. That doesn't necessarily translate to a zero for the ass uh, assess not assessment uh, application objective. But if you do get the primary objective, as long as lab goes pretty good, you, you'll get that application objective. Which I'm uh, I'm still grading the first homework, uh, first round of homework. So I hope to get that out uh, tomorrow with the latest. But. Uh, but yeah, if you get the application, if you get the primary and lab goes good, you know, you're almost certainly going to get the application objective complete. But if you don't get the primary, and especially if you, it is really close, especially if you have all the testing objectives and everything, and you're just missing this one little thing and lab goes well, you might still be able to get that application objective. At the very least, you'll get some feedback that says, hey, have some extra time to, to complete that. Um, but yeah, if it's, uh, on the other hand, if you have, if you're close on the primary and you decided to skip over all the, the testing objectives, three objectives, it, for, for any students who that's the case, you know, I'm going to be much less, uh, much less lenient on that, I guess. Uh, if you ignored the scaff thing, went for the whole shot, and then didn't get it. you didn't get this application objective if you're just failing one test. I guess, uh, was that your question? Did I answer your question? Or I feel like I might have missed it. That's fine. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so, so the not passing all tests, if it's failing just one of my certs. So I'll, I have this big test that basically takes your calculator and just starts mashing the buttons and has a whole bunch of certs along the way. If even one of those certs fails, you just get did not pass all tests. If they all pass, then you get application objective complete. Or not application objective, uh, functionality complete. Yeah. So if you like complete the homework um, and you demonstrate everything that like all the lecture questions were supposed to hit on, but mm -hmm. you didn't necessarily complete a lecture question or two, could you still get credit for not only the application objective, but also the like overarching, I forget what the, it's the learning objective? objective? Yeah. yeah, could you still get it without completing I, the lecture question? I can, that? yeah. And I can, I can use the homework as more evidence that you did complete the learning objectives. Uh -huh. So if you, yeah, you miss maybe one lecture question just didn't work well with you, but you were able to get the homework, I can certainly take that into account. And I have for learning objective one, it was only a few students, most uh, of the class, uh, if you didn't finish your lecture questions, it was usually LQ6 that was the issue, which I really wanted to see that one to, to know that you understood the references. Um, but there were a few students who got lecture question six, but missed one of the earlier ones, and I was still able to give them credit. I took a look at their, their homework, and they had the testing objectives and stuff. So I still gave them the learning objective without having all the lecture questions done. That's always a possibility. I'm gonna look at all the evidence available to me, and make an informed decision. Uh, talk about some things. So, so we just wrapped up object-oriented programming. We're going to move into functional programming. So I want to take a, a few minutes to kind of talk about the two. These two are two different approaches. They're two different paradigms that we can take while we're writing software. And they are two very different paradigms. And after these two sections, you're going to have choices. Like, which one should I use? when I'm approaching a particular problem, should I use either of them? Should I use both of them? Uh, there are tools in your toolbox that you can use after we learn them. Throughout each of these, I am restricting what you can and can't do artificially just to force you to use the one that we're learning in class. So I'm forcing you to use that programming, program, forcing you to use functional programming, and then after that, there won't be any more restrictions for the, the last learning objectives. Uh, but these two, I do have to specifically force you to use them. Or else, uh, or else you don't have to, and then you don't get to learn what these things are all about. With object-oriented programming, the big thing that we did, I, pretty much everything that was object-oriented programming, and I'd argue everything that is object-oriented programming, revolves around one word, and that word is state. We've heard it a billion times over the past two weeks. There's state variables. Objects have in this, these internal states depending on the values stored in these variables, and they have different behavior depending on those values. 
They also can have, as we're seeing with the homework and with the state pattern, different behavior based on the specific type of a state variable. That type can change the behavior. And as that object gets replaced with references to different objects of different types, we can change the, uh, significantly the behavior. But it's all about state. What's the state of this thing? And I restricted your control flow to, to force you to, to focus on the state changing the behavior. With functional programming, we're, it, what's going to seem like a pretty hard shift as we move into functional programming, because functional programming pretty much says no state. Nothing can depend on the state anymore. And things have to be immutable, which we'll talk about. And, uh, and not, which means not changing that state, not depending on that state. And of course, we're going to see a lot of functionality changing based on functions this time instead of values or types. Uh, functionality changes based on function definitions. So, with, uh, so I'll restrict your ability to take advantage of states. So it is going to seem almost like opposite approaches, and to an extent they are. Uh, but I'm going to restrict your state by banning things like bar. You won't be able to change a value after you assign a value to a named value. You won't be able to change that anymore. None of your state variables can have, uh, can use bar. You can't change those after they're defined, after they're declared and assigned. Can't change those values anymore. Uh, and we'll see over the next two weeks how to get over that restriction, how to write code that is able to still compute things given that. To that end, we'll see Recursion, this is going to come up on Wednesday. We won't talk about recursion today. Uh, it's been teased a little bit earlier in the semester when we're talking about stacks and stack frames. I gave a recursive example uh, just to get you aware of what recursion even is. Uh, and we'll, at this point, I will start expecting to be able to write recursive methods. So Wednesday's lecture question is going to be write a recursive method. I'm going to ban var and try to make sure that there's no way to cheese the, the assignment. You'll have to use recursion. So recursion, we'll see. Today we're going to start the second bullet point using what we call first order functions. This idea that a function is just a value in our programs and we can use a function anywhere we could use any other value of any other type. Now that's what we'll start talking about today and that'll be a, a constant theme throughout these two weeks. And finally next week, the last two lectures, we will talk about immutability directly. So last time, when I talked about strings, I said, let's pretend strings are on the stack because that's how they behave. Well, when we talk about immutability, we want to revisit that, tackle it head on, and say, see what's exactly happening with those strings. They actually do go on the heap, but they behave like they're on the stack. What is, what is that? What's going on? And we'll see that whenever we call a string method, if we call string, uh, string dot replace, maybe we want to replace dashes with spaces or something like that. What that actually does is create a brand new string on a new at a new memory address on the heap and then returns a reference to that brand new string that was created while completely preserving the original string on which that method was originally called. So that's how we get that behavior. Uh, that's how we're still passing strings by reference, but we're not having the effects of having a method take a string by reference, make a change to it, and have that change reflected somewhere else in our program. We don't have that behavior with strings because they are immutable. So what does that mean? How does that work? And how do we write immutable classes? Classes where we're gonna, that we're going to use to create immutable objects. Uh, this immutability, we will hit it a bit during functional programming, but it won't be until a little later in the course when we talk about event-based architectures that we really start seeing the payoff of that immutability. So, we're going to talk about all this immutability and, not, uh, and restricting states for the homeworks uh, and that, but why? It's going to really become apparent when we talk about event-based architectures. And event-based architectures, uh, I'll try to keep it brief because we're going to spend a lot of time on it later in the semester, but event-based architectures is going to leverage concurrency, which means we can have two things happening at the same time in our program. So what happens if we have two things happening, two pieces of code running at the same time, and they both have a reference to the same object on the heap. What if one of them wants to make a change while the other one's reading it? Or what if they both want to make a change, something we call concurrent writes? What change is actually applied? They both want to say uh, reference dot state variable equals three or seven. Is the variable going to be assigned three or seven? What's going to happen? 
lot of questions, a lot of things that can really significantly break in our programs unless we have immutability. If that object is immutable, no issue at all. It's effectively a read-only object, and we don't have those issues of concurrent writes, reading while someone else is writing, or any of that. It all goes away, it's not a problem. So that's where we're gonna see the real payoff. With event-based architectures, a lot of problems just go away when you have immutability in, in immutable objects. This is very advantageous. Um, this is kind of the, the new thing we all have to think about and worry about. Uh, of how do we scale our applications up on kind of modern hardware. So processors, they're not getting any, I won't say any, but they're not getting much faster anymore these days. But we are getting more cores. So we have multiple cores, multi-core machines, we probably all have multi-core laptops in this room, where multiple things can be happening on multiple cores at the same time. We don't want our programs to have these two cores modifying the same uh, memory address on our RAM. Mutability solves that problem. And what if we have apps where we want to scale up even further? If, uh, if we have an app that's too large for a single machine to run, even if it is multi-core, and we have multiple machines, a distributed system, with multiple machines working to deliver the same app. So if we think of something like Netflix, Netflix can't run on a single machine, can't run on a single laptop or a single server. We have warehouse, uh, Netflix has warehouses full of servers, racks and racks of servers, all working together to deliver one experience, one app. So uh, if they have that set up, that system set up with a lot of mutable data structures loaded in RAM, first of all, how does a two uh, distributed, uh, a distributed system even share a single RAM stick? That's a pretty big question. Um, but uh, how would they even share a RAM stick? But how do we build these apps in a way that doesn't have those problems, where they can share data across multiple machines, across multiple cores, and not run into a bunch of trouble. Uh, immutability lets us do that with at least, at the very least, one less thing to worry about. If we just have immutable objects, I can take this immutable object on this uh, server, on this rack over here, send it over to this server over here, and not worry about the state changing between them. I know if I gave them a copy of that, we both have the same data forever because it can't change. So I don't have to worry about it changing. Uh, and after functional programming, like I said, there's no more restrictions on what you can, can't do. I won't restrict control flow or, or state again after we had data structures and algorithms. Data structures and algorithms, event-based architecture, software engineering as we talk about the project. No restrictions. Uh, in the homework assignments, I'll often use a mixed hybrid approach. We'll use some functional programming ideas, some object-oriented programming ideas. We'll use state and immutability as the situation sees fit. And when I don't define what approach you can use, it's up to you. Should, is this an object-oriented approach? Will that be appropriate for this? Is this appropriate for a functional programming solution? Is it appropriate for a hybrid solution? Or is it appropriate for no solution? Which is often, you know, a lot of times the best option. Go back to 115 knowledge and just write some procedural code. Here's a bunch of lines of code that get the job done. I don't have to use any extra structure. Sometimes that's the best approach. So it's going to be up to you. Which of those approaches do I want? because you're gonna have both functional programming and object-oriented programming in your toolbox of approaches that you can use whenever you have a problem that you have to tackle. So with that, let's talk about sorting. So sorting, it's one of those topics we just love to talk about, we love to teach it. Uh, I, I have my speculation, I think sorting, it's. It's one of those topics that you, you get it. Like from before you stepped into 115, you know what sorting is. You understand the idea if I have a bunch of things and I wanna sort them in some particular order, you know what that means and then we can leverage that understanding to be able to teach whatever concept of the day we're trying to teach. So in one, uh, 115, they were, you know, they were teaching basically programming. How do you program? Okay, here's a problem, sorting. You know what sorting is? How do we sort in programming? Uh, in one, and then we're going to revisit mul multiple times. I'm gonna revisit it today to talk about first order functions and what those are, but I'm using sorting as just a, a way to talk about first order functions. First order functions is really the topic of today. Uh, 
And then in 250, you're going to see sorting again. It doesn't go away. You're going to hear about sorting more than you want to know. Uh, 250, you're going to talk about sorting again. It's going to be used to motivate runtime analysis, big O notation. Uh, we dabble in asymptotic notation 115 and 116, but don't really uh, address it head on and talk about asymptotic notation. Uh, 250, you're going to be doing runtime analyses, and you're going to revisit sorting to be able to talk about that with a topic that you already understand. And then in 331, you're probably going to see it again. The content of that course is changing up a little bit. I, I think, I don't know if sorting is going to stay in that or not. Uh, uh, or if this content is going to be moved to 250 also. Uh, but you'll see sorting again when you learn proofs. How do we prove that our sorting algorithm, algorithm always outputs the correct sorted order on any input? And how do we do that even when the algorithm becomes more complex, like merge sort that we'll talk about on Wednesday? How do we prove that merge sort is always correct on every single input? Uh, that's what you'll see the fourth, maybe even fifth if somebody else is using uh, time you see sorting. So it'll come back often. This isn't the last time you'll see sorting. Certainly not the first. So we're going to talk about some sorting. Uh, our goal today is to be able to solve this problem. There's a decent amount of text, but the question, once it actually gets time for you to be writing this question, uh, it's only a few lines of code. I think my solution is like five lines of code for the question itself. My TA said I shouldn't, shouldn't say anything about my solutions because then everybody takes it as a gold standard. So don't take five lines of code as, as the absolute standard. But I think that's where mine is. Uh, so we want to write this one method, generic method, that takes a type as a parameter, takes a list of ints as a parameter, takes a function as a parameter that takes the, an int as an input and returns the type of the type parameter, mm -hmm. and then returns a new list with that function applied to each element of the new list and preserves the order of that list. So the actual coding, there's not a whole lot going on here. But there's two big things in this. What's a type parameter and a function is a parameter? What the crap is that? Those are the two things that we want to talk about today. And then once we have those, this lecture question will make more sense. It probably doesn't make much sense right now. Uh, and then writing a test suite. The test suite is, uh, I think, a little bit more difficult than the question. Neither of these are too hard after you understand uh, first order functions and type parameters. Um, but the test suite is probably a little tougher, but I, I want you to see both ends this. How do I write a method that takes a type parameter and a function as a parameter? And how do I call that method? How do I give it a type parameter? How do I give a method a function to be able to call this and have it be able to do what it needs to do? All right, so sorting. In case, uh, in case you want to know what sorting is, we want to order these elements order the elements of a data structure according to a comparator function. What I want to focus on today is that comparator. That word comparator, and I guess the word function, it's all about functional programming these two weeks. But that comparator, what does it mean to sort based on a comparator? So sorting in Scala is just a one slide without even a lot of text. We've done this earlier in the semester. We had a method that returned a list, and we wanted to test it be able to see if it returned the correct list. So we took our expected output list, we took the actual output of the method call, we sorted both lists and said, are these lists equal? After sorting, it would check uh, element by element to make sure that they were the same element, same, uh, the elements returned true on the dot equals method, uh, element by element throughout those lists, and found out if they were right or not. We did that just by calling dot sorted, done. Dot sorted returns a new list contain the same elements as the original list, but in sorted order. So we want to sort these values, that sorted, we get a new list, same elements, sorted order. Simple enough, straightforward enough. Done that already. So this calling sorted is going to use the default sorting comparator. And the default sorting comparator is the less than function. So if we go through the sorted order, we expect every value to be uh, not necessarily less than the next value, but if we go backwards through the list, this value, I think, I think of which way to say this, there, it'll be sorted in, in uh, non-decreasing order. Let me just say that. I think you know what I'm gonna say, I'm gonna spend too much time trying to word it. But we're using the less than function to decide if the ordering of, the relative ordering of two values in this list. 
So the only thing we can do with the less than function is take two values and say, does this value go before this value in the final sorted order? And based on that, we want to be able to sort an entire list. This is what we call comparison sort. It's really the, when we talk about sorting in computer science, we really pretty much always mean comparator, uh, comparison sort. Where we have a comparator that can compare two values and tell us the relative order of those two values. And that's it. That's all we have. And we got to sort based on that. So what if we don't want that ordering? If we don't want to sort in by less than? Well, then we can use sort by and give it a method or a function as an argument. And we're going to sort the elements using the default sorting order of the output of the return value of this function or method, method in this example. So now, instead of just sorting these numbers using the less than comparator, we're going to apply math.exit value to every one of these elements and then sort using the default ordering, the default comparator for, uh, for ints, but after calling math.abs. So we get the abs style of sorting from this. And if we want to take this one step, for, oh, yeah, you can do that. Oh, I didn't update my slides. Next two weeks, we're going to do that. Uh, but what if we don't want to use the default ordering? So we can specify what to sort by. We can sort by the default sorting. Uh, but what if we want completely custom sorting? For that, we're going to use sort with in Scala. Sort with is going to take a function or method, but a function in this example, and I'll specify the difference. Uh, a function that takes two values of the input type and returns a Boolean which is going to return true if the first input comes before the second one and false otherwise. So by that definition, if A comes before B, this is going to return true. If B comes before A, it returns false. Or if A and B, their relative ordering does not matter, it's going to return false. So what we've seen so far is I'll review from 115. It's in Python, we could specify the keys, which was just like sort by that we just saw. That was our Python style of sorting. In JavaScript, we had something like sort with, except we had three different return values, a positive int, a negative int, or a zero. And now moving forward, we're going to see the, the uh, more standard, I don't know why JavaScript sets it up like that. Actually. Uh, I think Java sets it up like that too, now I think about it. But uh, we use the more traditional, at least from a theoretical computer science aspect, if we're not programming, we're, we're writing proofs and stuff, this is the comparator we like to use. Uh, traditional in that sense of give me two values and I'll tell you if the first one comes strictly before the second one or not. We can use this to simulate the JavaScript based comparisons. If we have two values, we call, uh, we call the comparator and it returns false. We reverse the order of our arguments and it still returns false. Well, then their relative ordering doesn't matter. They're effectively equal and I can uh, order them any way that I want. That's effectively, it's two method calls, but it gives us the same functionality of finding out if the JavaScript style comparator would return zero or not. So we still have the same functionality as that JavaScript one. We just do it with a little less complexity in our definition of the comparator. We can still do the same exact thing as we did before. So, uh, so that's all mostly reviewed is just how we do it in JavaScript. Plus that, that stuff, that content comes and goes pretty quick in 115. So we can probably use some review on that one. Uh, but what we did here, what we kind of snuck by you in 115 is this idea that you're giving functions to other methods, you're, you're calling methods with functions or sometimes other methods, and it just kind of, there's some magic that happens and then it just kind of works. That's what we want to talk about for 116 is what was actually happening when you sorted by some custom comparator? How did that sorting method actually work and actually sort my values when I gave it a function or method, um, as the case may be? Last semester, it was all, everything was functions, wasn't it? You never, yeah, you never even saw a class or an object. It was, uh, it was all functions. 
So when you give a function another function, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm not going down that rabbit hole. Uh, there was a method. You gave a function to a method. You did use methods. You just didn't know you were using methods. If you had a list and you did dot sort, uh, dot sorted, that's a method from the list class. You just never talked about list being a class in Python. But anyway, that's besides the point right now. Uh, we're calling a method, giving it a function. But what I want to talk about today is what is a function in Scala and how do we use this and how does this stuff work? Okay. So this, what I have highlighted right now, is a function in Scala, and Scala supports what we call first order functions. It's different from the mathematical definition of a first order function. In programming, when we say first order functions, we mean that we have the functionality that we're going to talk about over these next few weeks, that we can treat functions as values. Functions can be uh, arguments in a method call like this, uh, and we can store functions in variables, as we'll see on the next slide. JavaScript and Python both supported first order functions, and most languages are adding support for first order functions if they didn't have them before. So at some point, these slides will just say functions. I wanted to specify first order, because first order will just be all you know. Um, and it is all you know coming from Python and JavaScript anyway. So this is a function. I want to tease this apart and show in multiple steps what's going on here. So just like when we call a method with, say, an int, as a value, if I just had five in here, and I change that to say val i equal uh, of type int equals five, and then said i here, doing the same thing here, but I'm doing it with a function, and I want to uh, specify what's going on with that. And of course, oh yeah, and of course I, I'm using greater than here, so I'm overriding the default uh, increasing sort of behavior and giving it decreasing. There are easier ways to do this, but uh, and we're not really using taking full advantage of what we're doing here. Just we would just sort and reverse would be an easier way to do this. Um, but I just want to show what's going on here. You could use this to do more complex sorting, of course. So this right here, let's talk about the syntax and all the stuff that's going on on this line. I'll talk about this line for quite a while here. So this here is a function. It's the same exact code that I had in the green box earlier when I had it within the call of sort with. It's same, the same exact code. This is the value that we want to pass into the sort with method. Uh, this is a function. So recall the, that a method is attached to an object. When you call a method, you have access to this, which is a reference to the calling object. And you can use that to access the state of that object. With a function, we're no longer attached to an, an object. Uh, and with the methods, methods are always created either inside an object or a class. If it's defined in a class, it's attached to all the objects of that type. It's always defined in that object or class. And we use the keyword death. We give it a name. And we can call that from objects of that type anywhere in our code. So those were all methods whenever we're using the keyword def. Here we're not using the keyword def. We're just, uh, we're just creating a function that's not attached to any objects. We don't have access to the keyword this to access the state of a particular object. We don't have any of that. We just have a function in the more mathematical sense. It has input-output behavior. Uh, and, and that's about it. We don't have anything extra attached to it. So this function, the syntax here, we have a parameter list, just like we would see with a method. We have a parameter list as the names of the input variables and the types of those input variables. But we don't have any name attached to this. We don't have a name and then the parameter list. We just have the parameter list. We're going to use this arrow syntax, equal greater than, which is similar to the arrow syntax for maps, how we had maps to, to values. The, the Scala developers like this syntax, so we get to use this syntax. Uh, this arrow, the reason we, uh, we have to use some different syntax is we need to specify uh, the difference between the parameter list and the body of the function, the code that's going to be executed. We used equals for methods, but we need equals to mean assignment right here. So we need a different symbol to be able to distinguish here. If we use equals, how do we know if we mean this equals or this equals? Those two equal signs in the same line have very different meaning. To get rid of that, uh, that parsing, 
we'll use a different symbol here to specify this is separating the parameter list and the body of a function. And then finally, the body of the function, the code that's going to be executed, this follows the same rules as methods. The last expression that's evaluated is going to be the return value of this function call whenever this function is called. The body, we can use the syntax that we're more familiar with. If you want to use the same syntax, it does the same thing. Define the parameter list and then run this body of code. If you have multiple lines, you'll have to use this syntax. If you want to use the syntax everywhere, you're more comfortable with this, go for it. Use the braces, use multiple lines, um, the same way you would define a method. I'll go back to the other syntax. I'll use that syntax. It's more common with functions because we usually have very simple definitions with our functions. If they fit on one line conveniently, it's common to just write them up in line. In fact, we can do the same thing with methods. If you want to define methods in line, it's just less common for methods. Usually it's uh, using the brace syntax for methods. But we can do this, use this same syntax for methods. It's typically, I don't know, convention, style, whatever, um, to use uh, the syntax in different ways. And finally, this part. What is going on here? So the, this line reads just like any other value declaration and assignment. We're creating a value. We're naming it comparator. We use the colon to say this is where the type is going to go. This is going to be the type. And we're going to assign it this value. So we're assigning it the value, which is a function. And this type is going to be the type of that function. And the type of a function is the types of its parameters and the types of its output. So it's return type. So this comparator value is of type int and int to boolean. You know, I thought this was. This mic has been, uh, has been dead for a while. I thought it sounded like it was off. Uh, so it takes two ints and returns a boolean. So as long as I have a function or even a method, I can store methods and variables too. If this comparator value is going to store a value that is a function that takes two ints as its argument, arguments and returns a boolean. We're going to use the same syntax, the same arrow syntax as we see uh, on the creation of the function. Our parameter list is not going to have the names. We don't use names for the type because names could be anything. This, uh, the value itself doesn't care what the function named its variables. It, it couldn't care less. But we, we're going to specify the types only in the parameter list, the arrow notation, and then the return type, and then assign it the function that we're assigning it. So a decent amount of new syntax. But in the end, we're doing the same thing as if this were val i of type int equals 5. Fundamentally, we're doing the same exact thing, except we have a function as that type instead of int. And this is what we're talking about for the next two weeks. This is the, the crux of everything we'll do, is this idea that a function is just a type defined by its input types and its output type. A function is actually an object in Scala. A, a function is stored on the heap for what it's worth. It's passed by reference. You pass a reference to that function that's on the heap. And you can have use that function as a, a variable type, as we see in this line, storing a function in a variable. We can use that function as an argument, as we see in the next line, sort with of some function. We can write methods like the sort with method that takes a function as one of its parameters. We can have functions as the return type of a method. We can even have a function as the return type of another function if we wanted to. We can use this anywhere we could use any other type. So we could have a data structure. We could have a list of functions that take two doubles and a string and output a Boolean. Uh, we can use this anywhere we could use any other type. A function is just another type in Scala. And we can create values of that type. And those values, just being Scala, happen to be objects. And these functions, they don't extend any val, extend any ref, so they happen to be on a heap.
Are there any questions about this line right here? The syntax, the structure, the functionality? Because this line, this is really the crux of what we're talking about for two weeks. So I want to make sure we're good on what's going on here. Because the rest of the two weeks, with some exception, um, immutability is kind of a, a, its own thing. But at least for the next three lectures, we're going to talk about all the implications of this, of being able to have functions as values and just pass around functions all around our code. So any questions on this one before we move on to the implications of this? So the first implication, if you're doing the calculator assignment, I have this hint at the end of the document. It's labeled as an advanced hint. Well, it's no longer advanced anymore because now it's just part of the content that, that you know. It's part of your programming toolbox that you can do, use. Is storing a one of the operators, one of the four operators in a variable. So there are cases in your calculator where when you hit the, or, I shouldn't say cases, but whenever you hit the equal sign on your calculator, you have to ask, you have to think about which function, which of the four uh, operators should be used in the evaluation, if any evaluation even is expected to happen. Uh, what should be evaluated? Or if you hit an operator button, sometimes that triggers an, uh, uh, um, an uh, the words, uh, sometimes an operator press triggers the evaluation of another operation, operator and moves the left-hand side and right-hand side around a little bit. But which operator, which of the four operators should be used during that? Well, it's tempting to create a separate state for each one of these and have a 4x blow up in some of your states. This is how I see uh, some students will have 10 or 14 states. That usually means they had one or two of their states that they multiplied by four for each, uh, for each of the operators. I've seen some students with 20, 30, even 40 states when they, they start multiplying, see the exponential blow up of multiplying their states by the number of operators and then a few other states that they didn't quite need uh, in, their, in their code. Well, you can cut down a lot of that and a lot of the complexity in your structure overall. If you just store the operator that should be used if the equal sign or another operator were to be pressed right now, store that operator in a variable. The four operators or functions, I just don't want to keep using the word function. But so the four operators are intentionally binary operators and they all take two doubles and return a double. This is why there's nothing on the calculator like factorial or negate this number, negate the currently displayed number. Uh, there's none of those unary operators which would take one double and return a double. They all take two doubles and return a double, partly so you can do this. You can store a function that takes two doubles and returns a double, that's the type, and then swap out that as part of the state of the calculator, swap out this variable to whatever operator you are expecting to be called, and then call this operator whenever the timing is right, whenever the time is um, fit for that. So there's one thing we haven't talked about yet. I just got one quick slide on how to do this with Scala is how do we sort our custom types? Uh, so far we've only sorted ints. In a lot of my examples we're just gonna sort ints because we know what ints are. Uh, but what if we had this list of animals where we have a little bit of polymorphism, cats and dogs, which I didn't show the cat and dog and animal code uh, anywhere in lecture. It's in the repo somewhere, I believe. It used to be a lecture question, so I don't know if I have it in the repo to be honest. Uh, but you can imagine I have a dog and a cat class that extend animal, an animal has a variable named name uh, in its definition, and then cat and dog set the name in their constructors. So with this, I have these cats and dogs, all these animals, and I want to sort them alphabetically, ignoring case of their name. So for this, I'm going to call sort with, give it a comparator, which in this case, I have defined as a method. Methods do function as functions, I, there are so many overloaded words, but uh, these do work as functions, so I can give it the compare animals method. It takes two animals and returns a boolean, so it fits what sort with is expecting. It fits that, uh, that protocol. Give it that comparator, and then I can sort these alphabetically ignoring case. If we don't ignore case, the case will matter significantly uh, in the sorting. I believe it 
the default behavior for string sorting is going to string by their ASCII values, what, uh, which is not going to give you the alphabetical ordering that you would expect. Unless ASCII values is what you expect. And you would get that. Uh, so this is the functionality that we want. By the end of the lecture, we want to write our own sorting algorithm that has this functionality. It can sort anything by anything. Sort any type by any type. That's what we want. That's what we want to be able to accomplish today. How does it work? And more specifically, how would we write that? Let's write that functionality. So let's recall selection sort. This, uh, this is another thing. You've seen it in 115, but it comes and goes real quick, and then you're never held accountable for that material. Uh, so I understand if a lot of you just uh, kind of ignored that lecture. We, we understand it happens. Um, selection sort and merge sort are, um, I believe, still one lecture, so it comes and goes so fast. Um, but selection sort, let's just quickly remember what this is. For selection sort, we're looking at the each index one at a time and deciding what value belongs in that index. So we start with the first index, find the minimum value in the entire list, and swap those two values. The first, whatever's in the first index with the minimum value of the list. When we do this though, and what we want to focus on today is that we accomplish this with only one, uh, one function at our disposal, just the comparator. And the comparator is only telling us how to compare two values at a time. Does this value come before this value and that's it? That's all we get to ask. So we have to compare these pairwise we, and use that to be able to sort this entire list. So how does selection sort get this done? Let's go through an example using the default less than comparator and sort this list with just calls to the less than comparator and, uh, and some extra logic, of course. So for the first one, we're going to take each value we're considering and say, is this the smallest value that I've seen so far? So negative 23, is this less than five? That's going to return true. So I know negative 23 comes with four, five in my final ordering or at the very least, their order doesn't matter if I, uh, if I check the other way too. So is negative eight less than 23? False, or sorry, that, one, that first one returned true. Uh, is seven less than negative 23? False, negative four less than negative 23? False, 10 less than negative 23? False, I get to the end of my list and negative 23 is the value that I'm comparing to. So I know 23 is the very first value because I've either compared it directly with every other value in this list or by transitivity, I know that it comes before every other value in the list, or at the very least, at the same, uh, same ordering. So swap those, 23, that's locked in. And now I'm only concerned with the rest of the list. This, is, this was less than, according to my comparator, uh, comes before, I shouldn't say less than, less than is just the comparator we happen to be using now, but it comes before every other element according to my comparator. And then I repeat, okay, let's figure out what goes in the second spot. Negative eight less than, uh, compared with five, true. Seven compared with negative eight, false. Negative four, false, 10, false. So negative eight goes here. Seven less than five, false. Negative four less than five, true. 10 less than negative four, false. Negative four goes there, so on, so on, so on, until we get to the end of the list and we're in fully sorted order. So throughout all that, we only used our comparator that takes two values and returns a Boolean, and we're able to sort the entire list just with that comparator. And that looks like this. So here's our, our code to do that. We iterate over the indices, find the minimum value, what value goes at each indice, and then do a swap, get that value in that indice. But how did we do that? We do that by taking that comparator as a parameter. And this is what sort with is doing. It's something obviously not identical. Uh, it's certainly not using selection sort. But it's taking a comparator and then using that comparator to figure out the sorted order, the ultimate ordering. So we took a function as a parameter that took two values and returned a Boolean be able to decide that relative order of any two values, and then we leverage that, we ask that, the relative order of two values, repeatedly, to be able to figure out our full sorted order. 
So in this comparator, when we have a value that stores a function, we call it just like we called methods. We give it an argument list, and it's going to return a Boolean. Now, we don't care what this comparator is. We just know, excuse me, we just know it takes two ints and returns a Boolean. And we hope that you know, the caller gave us a valid comparator, that, which is going to define a sorted order, so I can get their non-decreasing sorted order. Uh, but I don't really care that much. I'm just going to run the algorithm, call the comparator, and figure out how this stuff should be sorted. If they gave me a bad comparator, they're just not getting a, a sorted order. Uh, I'd say that's their problem. But, uh, but the algorithm is going to be defined just based on that comparator. So we have a list of numbers. We call our selection sort. We give it the list. Give it some function. I'll give it the greater than function so we can get these, these values sorted in decreasing order. My algorithm runs, uses that comparator that it was given. My algorithm does not care that it's sorting in decreasing order. Wouldn't care if it's sorting in increasing order. It doesn't care what order it's sorted on. It's just going to sort based on that comparator it's given. So this is how we get a lot of different functionality out of one method. Instead of swapping out states, instead of using inheritance or polymorphism, instead with functional programming, we're going to get a lot of different behavior and a lot of mileage out of a single method by taking in different, uh, different functions when it's called and having the caller be able to decide what the specific functionality is going to be by giving it different functions when it's called. But this sort and sorting algorithm itself, we write the sorting algorithm once based on a comparator, test it once, and then we don't touch that code again. We don't change this code ever again. But that code only works with ints. That's a big problem. That's a big restriction. We want to be able to sort anything. We want to sort anything on anything. Right now, we can sort ints on anything. Uh, but let's introduce type parameters so we can get this functionality. What if we want to sort, use our sort algorithm on animals and that compare animals method that we had earlier? What if we want to sort like this, but we're hard coded to ints? That's going to be a problem. This is where type parameters come in. With type parameters, we can specify a type that's going to be used throughout our method, and we can specify that type when we call the method. So to, to define a type parameter to say this method takes a type, right after the name and before the parameter list, we're going to give a type parameter list. We're going to use brackets instead of parentheses, and we're going to give the name, any name that we choose, and that's going to be the name of a generic type that the caller will specify. So we don't know what, the type this will, what type this will be, but we know the caller is going to give us some type, and we're going to use that type throughout our method. And we can't really do anything with this. We can't call any methods on it or anything. But if we get functions that can work with this type, we can use that functionality without even caring what it does. So we have this type parameter. We're going to take a list of that type, a comparator of that type. We're going to return a list of that type. We're going to create a list of that type. But that type can be literally any type in Scala. It's going to be defined, uh, chosen by the caller. And when we have type parameters, it's common to uh, shorten this to a single variable or a single character. Our types, that's just a name, just like a variable. We can name it anything we want. It's just common to use one single uh, uppercase letter for the names. In this case, I'm using T. A and B are common ones. For maps, K and B are common. K and B for key and value are the type parameters for map. Uh, but we'll use T here is our type parameter. Now when we call this code, our type parameter is animal. So all those t's are replaced with animal, and our code runs just as it would um, any other way. So, uh, and we don't have to specify, we can specify the type parameter right here with the same syntax. We don't have to do that though if Scala can infer what that type is. Here I'm giving it a list of animals. I'm given a comparator that takes two animals and returns a Boolean. It looks at this and says, okay, that was animal, that was animal, that was animal. I think the type parameter is animal. Scala has our back on that one, and it'll be able to infer that the type parameter is animal without us explicitly mentioning it. Like we do for like lists, map, array, we explicitly say list of int. We give it the type parameter. We don't have to do that if it can be inferred. 
right, any really quick questions? We're one minute over. See everyone Wednesday.